wrote this pathetic book when I was 16, where I was called, it was called Wall of the Worm. And I wrote this for a book, and I said it, and actually at the time I was a cleaning lady because I grew up really poor. We were very, very poor. At one time, my father, had, there was a, we had a family of six. My father, my mother, there were four kids now living in this house in Dundas. And my father, he lost his job, he got laid off. And in, in like 1970, he had to take a job for $2.35 an hour. He refused to go on welfare. He said, no, why would I take charity when I have two strong hands to, that I, I can work? He went out and he got a job for $2.35 an hour. At the end of the month, after paying our bills, we had $5 a week with which to buy food. So most of the time growing up, we used to eat a lot of dill weed and potatoes because it was cheap and filling. That's how poor we were. And, and so when... <laughs> When I was 16 at the time, I was, I was actually um, a cleaning lady for a while. I, I've done all kinds of jobs. I was a cleaning lady. And I used to clean house for this English professor from McMaster University. And I told him about my book, Wall of the Worm. And he said, well, let me take a look at it. So I left it with him. And when I came back the next week to clean his house again, he said, Roxana, I hope you don't mind. But I like Waldo so much. I sent it off to a New York publisher friend of mine. And I said, wow, I'm getting published. Uh, no. Instead, I got a rejection letter. And it was my first rejection letter. And actually, it was, a, it was actually a kind of a nice rejection letter. Like there's form rejection letters where they just say, dear author, blah, 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 we don't want it. And then they have personal rejection letters. And those are actually a fee what they're doing for you because they actually tell you why your, your story stinks. So I wrote, the, I, 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 I was absolutely devastated. I just thought, you know what, it's because I'm brown. She saw my name, it's different. She knew I was brown, that's why she said no. Because it's such a good story, she should have published it. And I thought, see, I can't be an author. So what I did was I actually went to college and I became something completely different. I became a biological chemical technician. <laughs> I thought, if I'm a scientist, it's not going to matter what I look like. It's only going to matter what I know, I, it, it, as so long as I've got the skills to do the job. And the thing is, if I'd ever actually made it as a, as a biological chemical technician, I probably wouldn't be standing here today as an odd children's author. Okay, because what happened was I graduated from Seneca College at the top of my class, but I was the last one to get a job. This was in about 82. It was the last one to get a job. I would ace the phone interview. I called them up on the phone. I have a Canadian accent. They said, yeah, yeah, come on in. And as soon as I showed up for the actual interview, they'd look at me and they said, oh, sorry, the job's been filled. And there was nothing I could do about it. Finally, I did get a job, but it was only for 20 cents above minimum wage. And I had to go all the way. I lived at Birchman and St. Clair, which is like in, 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 near Scarborough. I had to go to Western Road and Finch all the way across town. It took me an hour and a half every morning to get to work, and, it, and I got 20 cents more than minimum wage. And I thought, I went to college for all these years for 20 cents above minimum wage. And I thought, forget it. When my first daughter was born, I thought, no, I'm going to stay home and take care of my daughter. That's more important. But I couldn't stop writing. And right about then, my husband, he's like, when I ever knew? In fact, I thought he could have been Muslim because he was so organized. <laughs> and, but we got married. I got married when I was 17. And in March, we just celebrated our 30th anniversary. So we, 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 he's like Mr. Organization, and at the time, what he was doing, he was actually on the board of our local masjid. He was on the board of the Jami Mosque, which is the oldest masjid in Toronto, and they were putting out a newsletter for the community. And they said to me, they said, Roxana, you write. Why don't you do the women's page? And I thought the women's page, house cleaning tips and recipes. No, thank you. I said, give me the children's page. I'll write some stories. So one day, I actually got an idea to write a story. And the thing is, this actually led me to becoming an author. The, to putting aside all of the rejections and everything, what happened is one of the rules for writing is write what you know. Now, with rules of a worm, I don't know anything about being a worm. But I do know what it feels like to be a Muslim Canadian. And I got an idea. Because we're Muslims, we have to pray five times a day. And the first prayer of the day is really the hardest. What's it called? Fudger, right. Fudger. And we have to get up before the sun rises. Now in the winter time, that's not hard. The sun rises like quarter to eight. We can get up at 7.30. We still have time to pray. 
But in the summertime, this morning I got up like 4.15 to pray my budget prayer. And before we pray, we have to wash a lot. You might have no noticed the little signs in the washroom wudu area. It's called wudu. And before we pray, before we go up before God to pray, we have to wash. We wash, we wash our hands three times, our mouth three times, nose three times, face three times, right arm to the elbow three times, left arm to the elbow three times. We wet our hair, we clean our ears, we wash our right foot to the ankle three times, and our left foot to the ankle three times. And if you fart or go to the bathroom, you got to go back and wash again. And I got an idea. I thought, what if I write a story about this boy who gets up for fudge prayer, and he's kind of grumbling, grumbling. He thinks, oh, man, it'd be easier if I wasn't Muslim. And he says, she goes, oh, I'm telling you, you don't want to be Muslim. He goes, no, no, I just said it would be easier. And she goes, well, don't you know that your prayer isn't, you, for you, it's, you're, it's, a, it's a gift from God. God doesn't need it, you do. And he said, she said, he says, okay, fine, fine, I'll go. I'm going to go pray. So he goes and he makes his wudu. He looks at the toilet and thinks, nah, it'll take too long. He just wants to get back to bed. So he makes the wudu and he starts to pray. Now he has his, when he prays his sunnah, no problem. He prays it, no problem. But in the middle of this most important part of the prayer, his fart, he has a big problem. He's got the fart. But he doesn't want to break his prayer and go back and wash again. So he just squeezes and hopes nothing slips out. And he starts praying really fast. The words are like a blur in his tongue. And he goes down for ruku and it's hard to squeeze. He stands up, he goes down for sujood, he's down on his hands and knees. It's hard to squeeze. He's swaying side to side, trying to contain himself. He sits up, he goes back down, he sits up. He's almost done. He's just got a few more words to say. When it happens. No more need to squeeze, no more need to rush. His prayer is ruined. But it was so quiet, maybe it didn't count. So he goes ahead and finishes prayer like nothing happened. And his sister's looking at him like this. And he goes, what, what? She goes, oh, you're so gross. I heard you. Go back and make do and pray again. And he goes, oh, man. So he goes to the washroom, he turns on the tap. He said, no, forget it, I already prayed. Too bad if it wasn't perfect. So he shuts off the tap and he actually goes back to bed. He tries to sleep for about an hour. He tries to sleep. He can't sleep. Finally, he looks at the clock. He thinks, okay, forget it. I, I, I might as well pray. It would have taken him two minutes to go pray again. So he goes, makes a fresh wudu, and he prays again. And this time, he takes his time. He says the words like he really means them. And when he's done, instead of going right back to bed, he's sitting there saying his zikr. And, you know, God is great, God is great, God is great. And he's looking at the window, and the sky is all pink and rosy, and the grass is sparkling with dew. And it looks really pretty. So he grabs the book and he grabs the blanket and he goes out onto the porch to watch the sunrise. Now that's where his father finds him. Two years, two, two, two hours later, fast asleep with a Quran, which is our holy book, in his hand. Now, I said, now that story went out in the newsletter. The reaction was phenomenal. I had all these big grown up men, even the imam. He came up to me and he said, Oh, Roxanne, Roxanne, that was such a funny story. I know just what it feels like to try not to fart when I'm praying. And all of them could really relate to it. And I just want to show you guys that became the first story in this book of mine. It's called Muslim Child. And this is a picture, not of him, uh, not of him farting. This is actually a picture of him fast asleep with a Quran in his hands. Okay, it's so cute. Now, what, the reason why I put this story, this story first in this book, when I wrote this book, I wrote it with my husband, and basically what we wanted to do, we wanted to show uh, basically what human life is like as a Muslim kid. And I really wanted to put the Fajr story in first because what it is, it's a story really about spiritual awakening, okay? And in the process, basically this boy is fighting his own physical urges to, to maintain a good character with God, okay? That's basically a lot of what Muslims try to do with our lives. We resist a lot of temptations. We, you know, we follow the rules, okay? That's basically what it's about. But I also wanted a story that would be funny and engaging. I mean, I tell that story to kids all the across Canada, and all of them can relate and think it's hilarious about trying not to fart when they're praying. So this is something that is really a human uh, condition, and this is one of the reasons that it's really difficult. It was, it, was, it was tempting to give up. Um, there was one point where I really thought, I mean, it took me eight years to get my first book published. Now I've been published uh, now for 11 years, and I've been writing for 20 years. But there were times when I thought of quitting. And one of the times where it was right before the Salman Rushdie thing, 
Um, when I heard about that, I had, I, I had not gotten published yet. I was not published. I was just a wannabe. I was just striving for it. And we heard about the whole commotion. And I was so upset, like so many Muslims, I was devastated inside about this attack on, on, the, on the character of our prophet. It really hurt. And I said to my husband, I said, you know, why do we just take it as a community? They just slap us around and we just sit there and we take it. Why can't we write something that will show what we're really like? And my husband, he said, turned to me and he said, well, why, why, why don't you do it? I said, I can't do it, I'm just a housewife. And he said, well, nobody else is doing that. So what I decided to do with my stories, I thought, I'm just going to try to write stories that help um, basically bridge the cultures, create more understanding. And I mean, the stories though, but for me, the stories have to be good stories. I mean, this one, one of my favorites, Silly Chicken. It's about a girl who's afraid of, no, it's, it's about a girl who's jealous of her mother's pet chicken. She thinks her mother likes the chicken better than her. It's set in Pakistan. It's really funny. Um, and this one's one of my most popular books. It's actually been part of the ESPO, which is the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario. And this is a more serious story. This one's actually about my Afghan refugee foster child. And I got a chance to meet him. Now, I wrote this book. It took me four years to write this book. I, I met him and I wrote this book based on that meeting. And it actually won an international literary award in Poland. In Canada, it was kind of ignored, but I'm not bitter. <laughs> in Poland, it won this award named after a Jewish children's writer from World War II. His name was Janusz Korczak. <coughs> Sorry. And, his name was, and the thing about it, he has a story behind You see, he was a Jewish children's writer from World War II. And he used to write these books that were really popular in Europe. And when the Nazis invaded Poland, they rounded up all, all, all the Jewish people, and they were sending them to concentration camps. But when they found out that this guy was young and close up, they said, oh, we can't send you there. We love your book. So he was actually free to go. That's the power of story. But, but, but Janusz Korczak, he had all these orphans with him, they were children, and he said to the Nazis, he said, well, what can, oh, can I take them with me? And the Nazis said, no, those children, they have to go to the concentration camp. And he said, well, you know, I can't leave them. So he went with those children to a place called Treblinka, and all of them there were killed. I was really honored to receive this award. I was really, I, I thought, but I also thought it was kind of ironic, because here I am, a Muslim woman, and I want an award name after a Jewish guy. You have to think about it, that's kind of funny. But the thing is that the stories that I try to write, whether they're sad, whether they're happy, or whether they're in between, um, basically they're trying, I'm trying to uh, tell a good story first, and then bridge these cultural misunderstandings with stories. And I have some brochures and some flyers on the thing. I just want to quickly mention uh, this book here. I wrote this with two friends of mine. One's Aliza and one's Uma. Uma's Hindu, she's from New Mexico. Aliza's Christian, she's from Maryland. And the three of us, we're good friends. Despite our religious difference, we're good friends. And we thought, let's write a collection of stories about six kids who are friends, even despite their religious differences. And that became Many Windows. In this book, I, I wrote the Hanukkah story, the Buddhist birthday story, the Eid story, and the first and the last, and one of the Christmas stories too. And I had no trouble in terms of in terms of my own principles, violating my own Islamic principles, writing these stories. I had no trouble with that. Okay, and basically we wrote this to show how kids, these are six kids from five different religions, and they all get along. They're all friends. And I use basketball, because that's the coolest sport. You know, it's the coolest sport, despite the, the, the problems with the Raptors, and it really is the coolest sport. And I use basketball as the, the uniting influence on these kids. I think basically, yes, it was hard, it wasn't easy, but this country has been very kind to me. And I, sometimes I kick myself because I can't believe that I actually was able to have my dream of becoming a Canadian children's author come true. I have been all over Canada, except for none of it. That's the only place I haven't been yet. I have toured all over the country. I have been to Denmark, where I did a speech on freedom, freedom of speech versus cultural sensitivity um, in light of the Danish cartoon incident. That was really good, <laughs> if I say so myself. I've also, also been to South Africa. I've been to Mexico. I've been all over the States. And it's because of the opportunities in this country. This is something I tell all Canadians of all backgrounds. 
that this, in this country, it doesn't matter what you are, it's how hard you work and knowledge is free here. And that is the biggest thing. Without my library card, I could not have been a Canadian children's author. And I am grateful to my country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister Roxana Marshall, for an amazing speech. So entertaining and inspiring. Um, on behalf of the Muslim Association of Canada, I'd like to present you with a small thank you gift. Oh. If anybody has any questions about my book, I have a few copies of my new novel, Wanting More, and uh, Many Windows with me. So if anybody does want to, I came by Subway, so I didn't bring a lot. But if, if anybody is interested, also my brochures and my flyers are at the back. Please uh, feel free to take one. And yeah, talk to me. I, I'm, I don't bite. <laughs>